Hello, in this video, I'm going to talk about neural adaptations to strength training. Um, so there's this kind of issue of gains in strength versus muscle girth um, that I'm sure many of you have experienced. Anybody who has ever strength trained knows that sometimes your muscles get larger and strength increases with the size of the muscle, but sometimes we get stronger without there necessarily being a change in the size of the muscle. And that's what we mean here. Um, so there's a lot of speculation, a lot of research uh, on this area in terms of what is changing in response to strength training that is causing us to be stronger even when the muscle isn't actually getting larger. Um, so actually only about half of our maximal voluntary contraction is explained by cross-sectional area. So like if we took a muscle and cut it, and what is the area of that cross-section, um, that cross-section is correlated with strength. But only about half of our maximal voluntary contraction is explained by the difference in cross-section between one person and another. Um, so how do we account for that other half um, in terms of what is causing the difference in strength if it's not the difference in size of the muscle? Um, so some of the things that have been proposed and have been studied and demonstrated to some extent um, for one is muscle density. So as we're strength training, if we are losing intramuscular fat and the muscle, um, the tissue is becoming more dense. So we have more myofibrillar um, packing density. We have more um, muscle filaments that are packed into a smaller um, place, a smaller area. Um, then we have more dense muscle, which could lead to greater strength with still the same cross-sectional area. So it's still the same size of the muscle, just more dense. Um, it could also be related to changes in the angle of pination. Um, so meaning the angle of the orientation of the muscle fibers relative to the axis of force generation of that muscle it could be related to changes in connective tissue content. Um, so in terms of collagen and elastin, so how is the connective tissue changing in response to uh, strength training? Um, could be related to torque length relationships that could be altered. Um, and then of course, there is the neural component. Um, and that's really what we're gonna discuss here. So the neural component, there are lots of, uh, there's lots of evidence uh, to support the fact that there are neural adaptations to strength training um, that might contribute a significant amount of the increase in strength, even when there isn't necessarily increase in size of that muscle. Okay, so first, strength gains are task specific. So it's really important when we are strength training that we consider specificity. Um, so our improvements in response to exercise are specific. Uh, the adaptations are very specific based on what the task was that we're performing. Um, so performance increases the most during a task used for training, partially due to changes in the nervous system. Okay, so part of the reason that our adaptations are so specific to the task is because of how the nervous system adapts to that task. Um, so there are uh, mechanical muscular adaptations that are specific. So it could be related to which part of the, the fibers or which section of the muscle is being activated, that sort of thing. So there are differences biomechanically in what parts of a muscle might be activated depending on the task um, or what uh, energy systems are activated depending on the task. Um, but the nervous system uh, changes very specifically based on what the task is. So depending on if the task is done at a high velocity or a low velocity, the improvements to the nervous system are going to be very specific to the velocity at which the training took place. So like if somebody is strength training and they're always doing it pretty fast, they're not necessarily going to have the same strength gains at a slower velocity as they do at the, the fast velocity that they're accustomed to working at and vice versa. Um, so if you're looking for overall strength gains at any velocity, then that means varying the velocity that you use during training. 
Um, so maybe you have a fast week and then next week is a slow week, or it could be every other workout or every other um, activity, every other exercise. Um, so improvements are specific to velocity. So if we want a variety of improvements, we need a variety of velocities. Um, strength gains are also specific to whether the activity or the exercise was done unilaterally or bilaterally. So let's say you're doing a bicep curl, just to keep it simple. If you're doing a bilateral bicep curl, then your strength gains are going to be primarily when you do a bilateral bicep curl. And if you stop and do a unilateral curl, you might not see um, as much improvement in strength in that unilateral bicep curl as you do when you do it bilaterally and vice versa. If you're always doing it unilaterally, you won't see as much improvement in the bilateral curl as you do in your unilateral curl. Um, and that's because the way the nervous system adapts to that exposure, to that exercise is specific to the way that the exercise was done. Um, same goes for explosive training versus heavy resistance training. And that's just one example of two styles of training that we can compare. Our adaptations are going to be specific to any style of training that we use. So if we want to get better at explosive movement, Heavy resistance training, although it will have its benefits, it's not going to directly uh, translate to improvements in explosive training and vice versa. Uh, eccentric versus concentric. So if we're training and focusing on the eccentric movement, we'll see a significant strength, strength uh, improvements in the eccentric part of the movement, but that isn't going to translate into concentric improvements and vice versa. And same goes for isometric. Okay, so whatever we are training for, whatever we are emphasizing and focusing on, that is where we will see the improvements. And it's not going to translate to other things unless we are also training those other things. So strength gains are task specific, and that is partly due to the adaptation of the nervous system to the way that we're executing that action. Okay, imaginary strength training. So this is further evidence of the effects of our neural adaptations to strength training. So strength training increase or strength increases can sometimes be produced by imagining the training. Okay, so there is evidence of this. There have been several studies and there are athletes who have discussed doing this and um, there's anecdotal evidence and there is peer reviewed scientific evidence uh, that if we imagine the task, we imagine the exercise, we imagine a whole training session or a game or a competition, whatever it is, that we can have adaptations to what we imagined. We will have adaptations that actually improve our strength and ability to complete that task. Um, now, scientifically in the literature, uh, it's been shown that that works in some muscle groups and not in others. Um, and it's not clear which ones are which. So some, it, sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't, depending largely on what muscle groups you are targeting. Uh, it's possible that the more novel movements and the more novel muscle groups that we don't use as often might be more susceptible to this than other groups that we use really frequently and, and all the time. So those heavily used groups might not be as prone to improving in strength in response to imaginary strength training as are the more novel groups. Um, but when it does work, it causes an increase in maximal voluntary contraction, increased motor unit recruitment and improvement in the contralateral muscle. So let's say we're doing the imaginary strength training only on one side. So we're imagining doing it, let's say with just the right side of the body. You will also see improvement on the left side of the body in response to your imaginary strength training. So if that's not evidence of neural adaptation, then there is none. <laughs> that's clear cut and dry evidence. Okay, cross education. Um, so what we mean by that is that the altered performance of a muscle contralateral to the trained one. So again, like I just mentioned, if I do imaginary strength training on the right side, I will have benefits on the left side. And so that's cross education. That's in the case of imagined strength training. Um, but the same is true for any kind of strength training. So let's say I have my left arm is in a cast. 
well, I can exercise and strengthen the muscles in my right arm, and that will have benefits for my right arm and to a lesser extent, but still significant, will have a lot of benefits on the left arm. Uh, so this is an important principle in rehabilitation um, because if you understand this principle and you apply it in rehab, um, then you can strengthen the injured limb by activating these neural pathways and using uh, cross-education, strengthening the, the, the good side so that we have the cross-education and strengthening of the injured side. Um, training decreases the absolute muscle area recruited per unit of force in the trained and contralateral leg or limb or whatever it is that we're using. Um, so what that means is like, let's say I'm just exercising one side um, with resistance training, we will have less absolute muscle area recruited to produce the same unit of force. So that means that the muscle is becoming more efficient. We're activating less of the muscle to produce the same force. So we're becoming more efficient, which also means that you'll be able to achieve a higher total amount of force when you activate more amount of the muscle because you're, act, you're producing more force per unit, essentially. So then you activate more units and you get that much more force. But the point is in cross-education is that if we only are training one side, we're also going to see that same improvement where the muscle, the activation is becoming more efficient that's going to happen on the trained side and on the contralateral side. Um, and so training specificity also applies to the contralateral side. So like how our effects of uh, strength training are very specific to the task and how we perform it, that also is true uh, and applies in cross education. So like if we only work one side, the specific benefits that we get um, in response to how we did the training, those specific benefits will still also translate to the contralateral side. All right, so specific neural adaptations that are happening in response to strength training. For one, we have increased motor unit recruitment. So we that's one of the primary adaptations that happen um, in a novel, in our novice, somebody who hasn't trained before, a new exerciser, um, when they start to strength train, one of the earliest adaptations we see is increased motor unit recruitment. So there's a steep increase in uh, strength early on without any change in size um, because their muscles get more efficient and better capable of uh, activating more motor units. So more motor units that we activate means more ability to generate force. So we see a very steep increase in the first couple months uh, in ability to produce force because of motor unit recruitment. Uh, then over time with training, we have greater synchronization of motor units. So greater synchronization, meaning that they're activating at the same time, um, isn't necessarily a benefit. It's not necessarily advantageous. Sometimes it's advantageous, sometimes it's disadvantageous. It can go either way, it depends on what the task is and what the muscles are. Um, but the, it's important because it's evidence that there's greater efficacy of synapses on motor neurons from supraspinal sources. So what we mean is that the fact that the motor units are activating in a more synchronized pattern is evidence that we're becoming more efficient and effective at the brain sending motor commands and then being executed quickly. So there isn't as much of a lag that causes asynchronized activation of motor units. It's happening more immediately and that's causing them to be more synchronized. So the synchronization in and of itself isn't important and sometimes it's good and sometimes it's bad, but it's that it's evidence of greater efficacy and efficiency of the central nervous system sending those commands out to the motor units. Um, we also see decreased coactivation. So in a novice, somebody who does not exercise and is just beginning a program, um, they're gonna have more coactivation. So they're gonna have um, antagonists that are contracting to a greater extent and resisting the activity, resisting the movement that you're trying to do. So like, let's say you're just doing a simple bicep curl, uh, we would have more coactivation of our elbow extensor, so primarily triceps, 
Um, there's gonna be more activation of tricep along with the elbow flexors, which means that we're gonna have less apparent strength. Like you're gonna be able to lift less uh, weight in that bicep curl because you have more resistance of tricep that's opposing that action. So with strength training, we have less and less co-activation, meaning that the antagonists are going to activate to a lesser and lesser extent with training because the nervous system is, is kind of getting the hang of it and saying, well, let's stop resisting this. We're trying to produce more force here. We don't need to be producing force in the opposite direction. There will always be some amount of co-activation um, for the sake of stability and controlling the movement and, and um, the finesse of getting the exact angles right. And there's a lot happening in every joint movement. So there is always going to be co-activation, uh, but we want to optimize that co-activation so that we're only activating the different muscles to the extent that is necessary to cause a controlled movement that we're looking for and being able to optimize the amount of force that we can produce in the direction we're trying to move. So that's a significant neural adaptation. Uh, there's also elevated reflex responses that happen over time in response to strength training. Now, again, it's not that the elevated reflex response itself is important. It's not that interesting, but it's that it's evidence that there's increased excitation of motor neurons uh, during maximal voluntary contraction. Okay, so it isn't that we care that there be elevated reflex responses, but it's that that is evidence that our motor neurons are more excitable. So they're more sensitive to stimulation and more ready to activate during maximal voluntary contraction. Um, and then finally, we have changes in the spinal cord that happen in response to strength training. So we have changes of the organization of the synaptic circuitry in the spinal cord, uh, which can change the recruitment of motor units during the task without changes to the cortex. Okay, so in the cortex, we can manipulate and change how we recruit different motor units, how we recruit different muscles, and to what extent to create all sorts of different motor pat patterns. Uh, and motor programs to change how we're completing a movement. Um, but we also, in response to strength training, will have um, some lower level adaptations. So adaptations that are happening in the spinal cord so that we have a greater ability to optimize and become more efficient at the spinal cord level um, without having to necessarily change the programming that is coming from the cortex. Okay, so thank you so much for watching and I'll see you in the next video.